Hello everybody, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today we're continuing our study uh, of the book of Acts. Uh, this is, I think, the, the tenth broadcast. Um, we're going to pick up where we left off last time. We completed chapter 7, so today it'll be chapter 8, verse 1, and we'll see how far we can get. We're, we're trying to be uh, thorough and, and patient, so we're not rushing through this. Um, with, with me today is uh, Brother Ted and Brother Joe. Let me, let me see if I can get uh, uh, one of you to volunteer to be the first commenter each time today. Go, go ahead, whoever wants to go first. I'll go ahead and take, take it this time, since how I pawned it off on uh, Ted last time. Um, I'll be magnanimous, but don't expect anything brilliant. This is Joe from the Sebastian Dresden Channel, a channel for learning and fellowship, not teaching. That's, uh, I leave that to the ministry channels and the other two guys who are held far more accountable. I enjoy the fact that I can say anything and get away with it because I just don't know no better. Uh, and I've been enjoying uh, the book of Acts a lot. And this may be the most interesting chapter, chapter yet coming up as I'm looking at it because it's, uh, it's Saul who will become Paul. So uh, this will be interesting. Back to you guys. All right. Thank you very much. And Brother Ted, say hi. Hi there. This is uh, Ted from uh, my channel. It's God's Truth Ministries. And uh, we've got videos on there for uh, evangelizing, you know, getting the gospel out and, uh, and edifying those of us who are Christians about the good news of Christ. And I uh, pray you'll give that a look. But I pray also that you really, folks, will uh, pay attention to these studies and acts. If you haven't watched them, like Luke said, go back and check them out. Um, watch them in sections if you can. Uh, but uh, you talk about uh, drama. I mean, uh, I'm glad this, the, the Book of Acts was actually made into a, a mini TV series last year, last fall, I think it was, called AD, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, there could have been showing more of it. But uh, this is true drama. This is true life. This is what happened in the early church with the persecution and the rise of uh, Christianity. And uh, uh, we're just right in the thick of it now. So I hope you folks will uh, stay tuned in today and be blessed. Back to you, brother. All right. Thank you. Uh, well, we'll begin. Uh, um, I do want to recommend, as usual, that uh, if if you're just beginning to, uh, with this video, uh, welcome. But I hope you will go back and watch it from the beginning. Uh, don't don't miss any part of it. Uh, the Book of Acts really uh, it was written approximately 60 A.D. and it begins uh, with the uh, uh, the ascension of Jesus Christ. And so you have a roughly a 30 year period that is being written about. It's the first 30 years of church history. And uh, we're, we're going to learn a lot about uh, what the church was in the beginning and, and, and how it went through a semi-transformation over the first 30-year period. It was, that's why the book of Acts is commonly referred to as a transitional book. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, chapter 8, verse 1. Now, Brother Joe, you know, he, he called me a name one time, and it stuck. He says, Luke, you're a KJV firstist. I like that. It's a, it's an accurate description. I like to read the KJV first, and most of the time, it's a, it's pretty easy to understand, and no other translation or commentary is necessary. But uh, oftentimes, I find it helpful to look at another translation, and the one I like to use is the Amplified, uh, because it's it's really more of a a combination of a of a translation and a commentary all rolled into one. So sometimes you get some some insights from it, some additional information that's helpful. Uh, however, uh, as, as we find in all the modern translations, sometimes we find some serious uh, mistakes uh, in their interpretation. So let's go with the KJV first, chapter 8, verse 1. It says, And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial, 
and made great lamentation over him. Uh, let, let's stop there, verse 1 and 2. And Brother Joe, you volunteered to give your thoughts first. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, and Saul was consenting unto his death. I guess that's, that's speaking of Stephen. So uh, here Saul is uh, putting his, his hat in the ring, uh, uh, giving his consent to the death of Stephen. And it says there was great persecution against the, the church, was at, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea, Samaria, except for the apostles. I think, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, this was the only church, right? There, there was no somewhere else. There was a church. Everyone that was a believer in Christ was in Jerusalem only, to my knowledge, and uh, it looks like, uh, thanks to uh, the persecution, everyone ran. Why? There, we figured there must be at least fifty thousand or twenty thousand. I don't know. A lot of people that were believers at that time. And after the death of Stephen, it appears people ran like rats, uh, except for the apostles. Now, I'm sure there was a, a hefty number of people with the apostles that remained in Jerusalem. I think this is just speaking in general. Uh, a good many of the people in Jerusalem fled for their lives uh, to other regions. Um, so uh, that's all I have to say on that. Luke, back to you. Well, I'm not going to let you uh, get away with uh, not answering this question here. The uh, before I go on to Ted, I want to have a follow-up question or your comment. And that is, um, you said that, uh, uh, that correctly, that because of persecution, the believers were scattered all over uh, in fear. Uh, not really scattered like rats. I wouldn't like to use that kind of comparison. But they, they, they were afraid, so they, they left. And this persecution is one of the reasons Christianity started spreading around uh, quickly. So in a way, this persecution served a great purpose. Uh, and I'm, again, I'm, I just wanted to ask you a question, but I couldn't resist making that comment. Uh, but the question is, uh, you correctly said that the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. And yeah, that's what the scripture says. Why? And no, 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 the question, the, the point you made was, uh, so far it's the only church. In Jerusalem was the only church. And so let me ask you, Brother Joe, to comment on that is the truth, but why was that? Well, I, you know what? I, 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 I didn't know that for sure. And uh, and something you just said clicks with me. You know, this is a great, God allowed that for the spreading of the gospel. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's, it's, if I were there, and I'm just thinking if it was me, uh, my comfort zone would be with the brothers. You know, I could be anywhere on YouTube right now, but my comfort zone's with a couple of brothers right here. It's, it's safe. But, uh, I have a, a familial situation, and and uh, I don't need to be out talking to a bunch of non-believers somewhere else on YouTube when I can be here where it's comfortable. Uh, not that we're not doing good. I'm just saying it's my comfort level, and I'm relating it to the church in Jerusalem. That would be where your your ties are at, and where your uh, uh, relationships and and uh, love and all that stuff is at but uh, if the cat and I'll, I'll go back to my rat thing if a cat's dropped into the middle of a room uh, <clears throat> the rats are gonna run and and I'm not relating Christians to rats but you know they're gonna take off out of their comfort zone and because they are believers and they are filled with the spirit wherever they go uh, they're bringing the gospel I suppose so God could have used this persecution to spread the gospel outside of the comfort zone, maybe. Um, and I forgot what your question was. <laughs> so I, I guess I will get away with that answer. All right, all right. Well, we don't want to delay too long to get to Ted. So I'd like Ted's comments on these two verses, but also I'll pass the question off to Ted. I think Brother Joe um, uh, hit on something that's important for everybody to understand. Uh, I think I've talked about this more generally uh, uh, on some of the earlier uh, uh, episodes on this study of Acts, 
But my question is, uh, it, I believe it's true that there is no other church except in Jerusalem. And why, why is that, Brother, Brother Ted? Well, I think the, the question is, uh, is one that we should consider, you know. Um, I think the reason that's the only church and the reason that's why the, the apostles, the, the disciples, stayed there, uh, I think it's, I'm going to disagree with Joe slightly on that's where their comfort zone was, uh, you know, being amongst uh, other believers. Uh, uh, I think it was probably anything but comfortable <laughs> in Jerusalem as we go through Acts, seeing what happened. Uh, you know, um, there was there was when it says in verse one there, and there was a great persecution against the church, uh, the body of believers there. Uh, I believe the reason they stayed was uh, out of obedience to Christ's command uh, in Matthew 28, and I think also the end of Luke, uh, where Jesus gave the great commission, and he said, you know, begin at Jerusalem. You shall preach the gospel, be my witnesses, beginning at Jerusalem, and then I think he said, unto Judea and uh, to the uttermost parts of the earth. I think that was the sequential order there. Um, I think they stayed there uh, not because of camaraderie or strength that they could get from each other, although that, that certainly helped them. But I believe their, their reason for staying there was in obedience uh, to Christ's command, uh, giving the Great Commission. And I was going to say some other things about those two verses, but do you want to respond to my comment there? No, I'll wait for you to go finish all your comment, then I'll take, I'll take a turn at it. Okay. Well, um, well, some things I just noticed right off uh, was uh, right off the first words there were, and Saul, you know, and I think we're going to realize that he's about to, uh, as we're reading through here, he's about to become a central figure in the book of Acts. He's about to become a central figure in, in what we now would call Christian history. Uh, this guy's huge. I mean, this guy wrote basically about half of what we call the, the canon of the New Testament. Uh, and if you include Hebrews, that's, that's 14 letters. Uh, I believe he, he probably was the mind behind Hebrews. Somebody else might have been the scribe or the amanuensis that wrote it down for him. But certainly he becomes a key figure, a central figure uh, in, uh, in church history. And uh, after being the biggest persecutor of it, he... And I don't think we can under, underestimate uh, the words there, a great persecution. I mean, we're starting to see some trouble here, uh, you know, in America. But and we know we know from church history, like like Luke. I know on your channel you've talked about uh, church history and you know uh, some things reiterated in, in books like Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, there's another book called Fair Sunshine. Uh, there's another book called Bright Lights and Dark Times uh, that that recounts uh, some of the great great persecution in the Dark Ages. By the uh, by, Roman Catholicism against Protestants, but uh, right here at Rome, I mean, right, I mean, right here at Jerusalem, uh, the greatest persecution came from from the Jews, from uh, uh, and all, actually all through Acts, you'd think, oh well, it's the Romans persecuting the Christians. Actually, no, it's the Jews. It's Jewish uh, leadership, and uh, of course, the Jewish leadership is what stirred up the, uh, the people, and of course, got the Romans to crucify Christ. So I don't think the, the phrase there, a great persecution, can be uh, underestimated at all. Um, another thing about the, the, there at Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is mentioned right there in the first verse, is from my knowledge, now we could go through this study, or and I could be found wrong, or you guys can correct me on this, but from what I understand, uh, actually from Stephen performing those miracles there in Jerusalem, from chapter 8, verse 1 forward, uh, to my knowledge, I could be wrong, but there's no miracle performed in Jerusalem after that. None uh, that I know of. I could be wrong. We're going to go through Acts, or you guys can tell me. Uh, so uh, I could be wrong. And the scattering in verse 1, you're also going to come talk to talk about that scattering uh, in verse 4. At least the scattering results in them uh, preaching the word everywhere they went. I know you're going to get to that in a couple of verses. And we'll also see that, I think, in chapter 11, verse 19, that at least they went abroad and went forth. They were scattered by fear, but God used it for good, is my point. 
and they went forth, uh, you know, preaching the word, preaching the good news. So God can use all things to get work all things together for good. Amen. Back to you. Uh, all right, um, you both did a very good uh, job, I think, uh, covering uh, that very well. But um, to answer my own question, um, I, I, Joe, you made a statement that, to your knowledge, the Church of Jerusalem is the church. There is no other church locations, uh, branches, or um, you know, whatever we would call. Them, uh, Today, I don't know what you would call it today, but the churches are not in other cities. Jerusalem probably just had, well, it had churches in different people's houses. It said that in an earlier chapter that, that they were going from house to house. So the, when we say the church in Jerusalem, it's just all the believers that are in Jerusalem. But so far, the believers were not abroad. Uh, but why why is that? And it gets back to my, my uh, introduction to the book of Acts, if someone walk, goes back and watches that, you'll see that I made a claim that we're, we're beginning, we're, we're seeing playing out here, and that is that uh, there were two big misunderstandings, errors in the, in the first uh, years of the church. Uh, one was that Jesus and, and salvation was, uh, came, was only for Jews. Not Gentiles, not Samaritans, just Jews. Um, and and then the other was that um, the Jews would should believe in Jesus, but they would continue practicing Judaism. And that was a mistake. But later they learned that they needed to, to separate from Judaism. You could not mix Judaism because Judaism could be called the law, and and uh, and. and Faith in Jesus is, is faith, and you can't mix faith in the law. So later they learned that they had to um, separate from Judaism, and so that this is something totally different. It's not just a sect of Judaism, but it is uh, something entirely different. Judaism has to be discarded completely. This is what we learn in Galatians and in the book of Hebrews. Um, so the, the reason that we only have the church in Jerusalem, uh, I think primarily, is that uh, they? This is where the Jews were primarily, and you know there were Jews dispersed in the diaspora. And we know that we referred to the Hellenized Jews that had come for Pentecost, so, but but the main concentration was in in Jerusalem. So this is where the apostles stayed because they didn't understand that uh, their mission was much broader. And there's so many things that Jesus told them. That we that are perplexing to us because they seem to ignore it. It just uh, it just didn't seem to uh, register with 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 them. Um, he told them about his death, burial, and resurrection, and, and then when it happened, they were kind of shocked. And, and they, even though they were told over and over again it was going to happen, they're told that they're going to be going all over the world, and and even the Gentiles would be included. But it, they didn't it didn't register with them. There will come a point when when uh, Peter meets Cornelius, that everything changes. Uh, but until that point, uh, they're still under the impression that this new faith is Judaism and Jesus, and it's only for, for the, the, the Jewish people, not the Gentile or Samaritans. Um, as far as the persecution, uh, it's interesting that up to this point, uh, with up to the point of Stephen, anyway, we, Stephen's the seventh chapter was all about Stephen, his sermon, his historical, uh, you know, uh, his uh, giving the history from Abraham to present time, uh, and then his his stoning and death. Until his death, there were no martyrs. He's the, he's recognized as the first Christian martyr. Now there is a, this disagreement as to the time frame between Pentecost and Stephen's. Death. There are some people who think it was a matter of weeks. I think that's way, way out of line. Um, most people think it's at least months or years. And 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 then uh, people who um, believe that uh, in Daniel's 70 weeks that they're they're continuous rather than separated by 2,000 years. Some people think that the 70th week of Daniel. There is a gap separating the 69th and 70th week, and they think the 70th week is comes sometime in the future. But those people who believe that the 70 weeks of Daniel are are continuous with no no gap, 
they would say, doing the math, that Stevens uh, was the end, uh, death was the end of the 70th week, and it uh, it was uh, roughly three and a half years from Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection to the death of Stephen. But re so, uh, regardless of exactly the time frame, uh, we can see that from Pentecost to Stephen's death, there was a period of time where they were they were arrested, they were put in jail for a little bit, they were you know they were beaten, but there was nothing, there was no capital punishment against them. Uh, Say they were told, don't preach in that name anymore, over and over again, but they kept on doing it. And then Stephen is martyred. Once he's martyred, it seems that the next thing we learn is that now there's a great persecution, and 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 the floodgates are open. No holds barred. Uh, Christians are, you know, there's a, a a bullseye target on every one of them. Uh, all right. Uh, I guess we could, we should go on, but I'll give if you a chance to just uh, make a quick answer to what I just said there, Brother Joe. Uh, addressing exactly what you just said, uh, yeah, I do see exactly what you're saying, and and that does seem to make uh, sense. Uh, now I'm a dispensationalist, uh, and and where many brothers are not, and so uh, I would have a dualistic view of uh, of, of the time frame. Uh, so there is there is another there's two sides to that coin, uh, regarding uh, uh, the persecution and the spreading to the Gentiles. Uh, I think that what comes to mind is I wish Ted would have been here uh, on this study when when Peter was uh, giving his uh, his uh, uh, sermon that he told everyone that the Gentiles were included, but it becomes clear. That Peter didn't even realize what he was saying. I mean, he, he said it, and it, and it was God-inspired, but he didn't even grasp, as we'll find out later at Cornelius's, uh, what he was saying until then. So a lot of times, uh, God can say things through us that we don't even catch. You know, I I know Ted has said things, and <clears throat> and certainly you have, Luke, where I don't think you've grasped the things that I've seen and what you've said. And I, I'm not sure. You know, God does direct our speech at times, so I think that's uh, that's interesting to say the least. Uh, I guess that's all I have to say. Back to you. All right, uh, Ted. Any more further comments before we go ahead? Sure, just real quick. And I, I think that uh, it's a it's a distinction that that people should look at. Uh, sometimes when the Bible says church, as you were pointing out, Luke, that it's. Uh, that it was centralized right there in Jerusalem. That was that was really the true where the true the body of Christ was. Now you you know you pointed out that there were some saints that met from house to house, uh, and you know in in the epistles we see that of course that there's uh, uh, Paul says greet the, the church at so and so's house and so forth. But uh, I think nowadays even to this very day people don't understand that church isn't a building or it isn't where someone pe someone meets. It's the scripture usually talks about that usually as the body of Christ, uh, and I think that's what it's talking about in verse one. And I, I think you're right on, on uh, you know the, the the church. I mean, the stoning of Stephen, like you said, it did seem like it was uh, open season now against the Christian, and I think that's true. Once uh, people uh, who are against Christians, once people see that they can get away with something against Christians. Uh, I think it kind of opens the floodgates. It primes the pump to, uh, to persecution and to greater persecution and to greater persecution. And I think that's what happened here, starting with the stoning of Stephen, because it wasn't that, uh, as you said, it wasn't that harsh. You know, they were they were maybe uh, told not to do it or maybe, uh, you know, imprisoned for a short time or whatever, but nobody was stoned to death just for proclaiming the resurrection of, and preaching the name of Jesus up to that point. So, uh We'll go on with that, brother. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'll continue reading you know, verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Uh, brother Joe? Yeah, uh, I think that, you know, it was said earlier by you or uh, Ted, one, that, uh, you know, 
I think both of you, that, you know, they were being obedient to God to start in Jerusalem and, and stay there uh, to the Jews first. Uh, this is one of those things where that's quite true, but I don't think it was by anybody's uh, choice other than maybe the apostles. It, God had just preordained you know, that, that uh, this would happen during Pentecost when Jews from all over the world would converge on Jerusalem uh, not to hear the gospel and not to be converted, but to celebrate a, uh, a, a typical Jewish uh, festival that was uh, a pilgrimage that was common in those days. And so uh, God had it preordained that way, I'm sure, without anyone's uh, planning and, uh, and I think likewise, the, like you uh, so rightly said, Luke, the gospel was spread uh, not so much by uh, the people's choice. Okay, now that we've done Jerusalem, let's go in the other part, outer parts of the earth uh, or whatever. I, I think it was um, more, you know, God had preordained, you know, Saul is going to kick things into high gear. The, the, the priests are going to say enough's enough. We've got to nip this in the bud. And uh, through God's uh, ordination, uh, the, the church was spread. I don't think anyone said, okay, we've done Jerusalem, now let's go spread the gospel. It's just how God had things planned. People need uh, motivated, and, and Christ uh, often uh, provides that motivation for us, whether we want it or not. Back to you. Mm. Yeah, good point. Brother Ted? Well, yeah, amen. I, I, I'm seeing that, you know, Saul, uh, you know, and, and once again, what I'm seeing in this verse is, is uh, reading between the lines, uh, this is Saul who, you know, embodies religious hierarchy, you know, uh, of the Jews, collaborating with the uh, Roman authorities to, uh, to persecute those, uh, you know, operating and, and uh, preaching in the name of Christ. Uh, the, 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 the Jews, the religious ones, they didn't have that authority. They'd have any authority they'd have to get, just like they got to, to uh, have Christ crucified, had to come through the religious, or excuse me, through the Romans, who were who were running that whole whole land and uh, were the ones who said yes or no to uh, imprison. I mean, the Jews didn't have prisons, you know. <laughs> you know, the only thing they had had was uh, like you know was rocks out in the outside of town to stone Stephen. They didn't have uh, prisons and, and uh, uh, the kind of uh, judges that would rule on civil matters like this. They had to go to the Romans. So that's what I'm seeing. And making havoc of the church was, was done by collaborating with what normally would have been the Jews' enemy was the Roman uh, establishment, the Roman government. And, uh, you know, they used it to the hilt to persecute the Christians. And... Uh, you know, therefore, and, and committing them to prisons. You know, uh, therefore, the the when it says they, the Christians, were scattered abroad and went everywhere. But like I said, uh, at least God used it. Uh, you know, for the glory of God and for the furthering of the message. Uh, back to you, brother. Hmm. Well, when it says laying havoc to the church, that sounds really bad. Uh, I'm sure it was, but. It says he put them in prison. Um, now, I might be proven wrong as we go along, but from my recollection, I, I don't remember examples of Paul um, not just putting them in prison, but actually killing them and executing, making it capital crime. Uh, maybe Paul rounded up, put them in prison, and then they were killed, but I don't, I don't know if it specifically states that. Uh, I, don't, I, I, I doubt that it does. So they're being imprisoned, they're being persecuted, uh, but being uh, being executed. Uh, I I don't I don't think the scriptures are going to explicitly state that as we go along. Maybe it will. But uh, the, the the thing that I want to make sure everybody doesn't uh, read into this this portion of scripture is that when it says they preached abroad, preaching the gospel. Okay. Uh, let me read how it stated again so I get it exactly right. Um, uh, Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Okay, so they're preaching the gospel um, that the Messiah has come, that uh, 
uh, it was Jesus. He, they killed him, and that he's uh, risen. And but um, they, uh, uh, it's easy for people to assume that because they're preaching the gospel abroad, that they're preaching to the whole world, the Gentiles. It doesn't say that, and I, I think it's wrong to to assume it. Read that into there. Um, uh, they're preaching abroad, but to the Jewish population abroad, the, the Jews were uh, dispersed all over uh, the, the Middle East with uh, in the diaspora. And I remember when we were Brother Joe and I were doing uh, chapter, I think it was chapter two, uh, Pentecost, and Peter did his sermon, and and, and Joe uh, thought that that when the Peter was preaching, and people heard it in their own language that they were hearing it in all these other languages and that the audience was a, a Gentile audience or at least partly Gentile audience because that these people were from all these other countries but but if you as we read the scriptures carefully we we realized wait it's it, it, they're not preaching to Gentiles this audience at Pentecost are still they're all Jews it's just that they're from other countries they're what's called the Hellenized Jews a lot of them no longer even spoke, uh, you know, Hebrew or Aramaic. They spoke Greek and or their other languages, but they were Jews. They believed in Judaism, and uh, they were either Jews by uh, uh, by being proselytes, or, or or they were Jews by by birth, uh, and uh, they um, so whether it's the Pentecost sermon. Or whether it's this statement here, where so they they were scattered abroad and they preached the gospel. Let's not think at this point that they're preaching to the gospel to Gentiles in, in, in any way, because uh, at this point the church is still under the impression that this this new thing, believing in Jesus, is is only for the Jews, and as and they're still a very racist segregated society in that they don't allow race mixing you're not supposed to associate with Gentiles especially you don't associate with with uh, Samaritans which is the result of mixing Jews and Gentiles and, and you you not only don't associate with them but you, you you will not share a meal with them and you're certainly Jesus is not for them so this is the the mindset. So we we got to be careful to not assume now that they're they're following the Great Commission and they're preaching the gospel to the whole world, all the Gentiles. No, don't assume that at all. They're only preaching to Jews even now. Uh, so uh, um, let me give see if you guys want to respond to that before I continue here, Joe. Oh, I, I just want I just put on the sidebar there. I didn't know you're coming back to me. Yeah, that was a surprise to me. Uh, all my life, I assumed otherwise. Uh, so this study we're doing right now uh, enlightened me. I, I was absolutely uh, just if anyone would have asked, I would have said, "Well, yeah, the preaching of the gospel of the Gentiles started on Pentecost," and so uh, that was very beneficial to me to learn otherwise. Uh, uh, one of the one of the real uh, helpful things that's come out of the study so far. Back to you, Luke. All right. Had any more thoughts on that? Yeah, I do, and. Uh... I don't think uh, they were doing anything wrong. That's that's my opinion by by not preaching to the Gentiles yet. I think their uh, their marching orders from Christ uh, was to go to the Jew first. You know, beginning at Jerusalem, then to Judea, then to the uttermost parts of the earth. I think their marching orders they were right, and I think uh, you know the only way that the Gentiles were going to get in, even in the few well, there's not maybe few, but maybe several Old Testament passages is once Israel becomes that nation of uh, a kingdom of priests and kings, you know, to uh, to be a light to the Gentiles. Um, this is why they didn't go to the Gentiles just, you know, like, oh, there's a Gentile, I'll talk to him on the corner, and then at, at noon I'm going to go meet a Jew for lunch. And then, you know, no, they, they were following, the, I believe, the marching orders. And I don't think it was all, you know, racism per se and all separatism, but I think they were following the plan that Christ gave them. I don't think it was uh, just negative connotations and although they probably had some negative opinions of, of Gentiles but I think uh, some of them had to know the plan that uh, it had to be the Jew first uh, to be the light to the world and certainly their, their personal opinions about Gentiles played into that 
but I think they were following the, the right marching orders by not going to the Gentiles yet, and I want to emphasize yet. So I'm sure you'll get into that, brother, so carry on. Yeah, be, before I read, read on, though, uh, I, I, I'm going to be very interested to listen to your comment um, that I believe is going to contradict what you just said. When we reach the point that Peter has preached to Cornelius and his family, and James finds out about it. When we get to that portion and you see their reaction, you're going to see that it was racism, segregation, and, and there, there's no way that they believe that, that he should be doing such a thing. So, um, well, let me carry on. Um, verse, uh, verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the uh, now this is an interesting thing here because they're in Samaria, and you think Samaria has all the Samaritans, but the Samaritans, even though they're not Jews, they believe in Jesus. They're they're like converts. The problem is they're they're racially mixed, but they still believe in Judaism. So that's an interesting uh, uh, situation. Uh, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them, and the people the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Whoops, there you go. There's the answer to your question, Ted. Uh, miracles are still going on. Um, okay, that's verse 5 and 6. We'll, we'll, uh, but that's not in Jerusalem, but carry on. I didn't know you specified only Jerusalem, but go ahead, Brother Joe. Yeah, uh, yeah. Ted did specify Jerusalem, and I, I think he's right. I can't think of any other miracles that do happen in Jerusalem after that. I was giving it some thought when he said that. I think he's right. But, uh, yeah, this is Samaria. And uh, this is fascinating because the first thing that comes to my mind is the story of the woman at the well with Christ. Now, this, you, you're going to have to, you guys, one of you, have to enlighten me. But I, I don't know how many years prior to, uh, it was it Peter? I'm sorry, I think it was Peter. Or was it, uh, somebody went to Samaria. Philip, Philip went to Samaria. Now, Philip, this is not the Apostle Philip. I think this is the uh, uh, Deacon Philip, if I'm not mistaken. And what comes to my mind is Christ was in Samaria, at the woman as well. That's where Samaria, you know, first comes into everyone's mind. And and uh, and Christ stayed there, didn't he? He, uh, if I again, if memory serves me, uh, she believed on him, and Christ stayed there for a day or two or three, and many people uh, believed on him. And this is before his crucifixion, so Christ himself has uh, uh, thrown some seed out there uh, for Philip to uh, walk into a very good situation, I guess. Now, I don't know how big Samaria is. I imagine it's pretty sizable. And uh, and they were Jews uh, and, and Gentile mix, like you say, Luke. Uh, I just, I just want to, I'm sure there's a connection here between Christ and the woman in the well and what's happening now. Uh, but I don't know what's coming next, so I'll just stick with what you've read so far. Back to you. Yeah, well, um I don't, I'll be interested to see if, if we come up with some connection. I never thought about them being connected just because they're both referring to Samaria. Maybe they, maybe we'll see something there. But what was interesting that you said was that um, you think this is the deacon, Philip. Now, I don't remember the seven names. Uh, of course, there's Stephen. But the other six, I don't remember their names. I, I, I think you're saying that one of them was Philip. But uh, then there's an apostle, Philip. Uh, now, I, I have always assumed that this is the apostle, Philip, but it's an assumption. I don't have any scripture that I just automatically assumed it. And I, for to, to think otherwise, uh, I don't know if there's any scriptures to support your hypothesis that it's the deacon. But let me uh, get to your thoughts. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure if this is uh, 
you know, the same Philip. I think this this might I I might have read somewhere where this might be the deacon Philip, but I don't know if it really matters at this point. But yeah, getting back to what Joe said, oops, you guys still there? Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, 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 I'm still here. I'm still here. Okay, okay. I thought I went offline for a second. Uh, but getting back to what Joe said, I think um, when it says in verse 6, the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. If we remember back in uh, John uh, uh, 8, I think it was, where, or no, John 4, where he uh, preached to the woman at uh, Samaria, and then the, uh, she went into the town and started proclaiming uh, what he told her, and then uh, many people ended up seeing him, hearing him, uh, the miracles that Christ did in that region. Many believed on him uh, in that region. So I think that kind of primed the pump for the people of that region, of, of Samaria, to uh, be ready for uh, a follow-up, you know. Uh, and the miracles that Stephen did just uh, confirmed that he was truly there uh, on behalf of Christ, uh, the, the gospel of Christ. But... Um, uh, you mean Philip, you said Stephen. Uh, that, that Philip did. <laughs> that Philip did, yeah, Stephen's gone. But, uh, yeah, I think it just confirmed uh, the, the miracles of Philip and the things he did and the things he said confirmed the, the seed that had been planted, or not just more than seed, but Christ's actual uh, presence in the land of Samaria. So uh, I think they were ready to receive the word. Uh, you know, I think that was uh, that was a time of, uh, of 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 great of good harvest uh, for God of what Philip did there at Samaria. Uh, okay. Um. Well, I think that that does make sense. I mean, obviously, Jesus, uh, they were familiar with Jesus. Uh, since he was there preaching himself, uh, the I, I looked at your note there, brother Joe, but I I, I don't think that's true. Maybe uh, maybe if I study carefully, it will be proven true. But you, you said the reason being he was not called quote the apostle unquote Philip. The apostles are always denoted as apostles. Uh, I think if we look up as we read through there, if we look or zero in on that premise. Uh, I think you can see a lot of references where the name is mentioned, but it doesn't always say the title apostle. Um, I, so I, I think you're wrong there. But uh, whether he's Philip the deacon, Philip the apostle, I don't think it's had really important either. It's just that it was. I was surprised. Never heard anybody even bring up such a uh, an opinion. Uh, so. Uh, I'll be interested to see if there's anything that we, we come up with that actually supports one side or the other on that. Uh, let me give Brother Joe another chance to respond before we move on. Yeah, uh, that's that's not an original thought from me. That's uh, from a teaching I heard a long time ago from uh, Chuck Missler, I think. And uh, it just popped in my mind. And so that's why I, I, I mentioned that. Hey, Luke, if I could say something. Yeah, go ahead, please. Real quickly, I'm I'm reading my online version of the uh, Amplified, and uh, you know how they put things in italics, which means that they're not in the text, but they it's just the commentators. And my Amplified says this in verse five: Philip, and then and then in the brackets, the deacon, not the apostle, went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Christ, the Messiah, to them, the people. So. Apparently, whoever did the uh, the notes for the Amplified, they put the deacon, not the apostle. So maybe they know more than we do. I, I mean, I'm not disagreeing. I think it very well could be the deacon. You know? um, well, as I'm reading the Amplified, I have them side by side. They're parallel as, as I'm comparing them. And it says, verse 5, Philip the Evangelist went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ. Uh, but whether he's uh, evangelist or deacon, uh, and it, that's different than the apostle, I don't know. But so far, I've heard the claim by uh, Joe. I, I've I heard you said that Chuck Mistler said it, but I don't know anything that supports it, any, any reason to conclude it. So I'm, I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. This is just totally brand new idea to me so uh, I'd like to see what they uh, how they support their conclusion let me uh, read further now back to the um, 
uh, verse 7 in the KJV, it says, For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was a great joy in that city. All right, that's verse 7 and 8. Brother Joe? Yeah, that's uh, uh, that's pretty powerful. Uh, it's it's uh, signs, wonders, and miracles following <coughs> the gospel presentation, and uh, so you saw what happened in uh, the temple with the healing of one guy who was well known uh, to the uh, Pharisees and the locals there. It it caused five thousand people to uh, believe on the gospel. And so uh, here we have uh, Philip, uh, and uh, the miracles are following him. And these are local people with uh, uh, people that other you know the locals know about, and they're seeing these great miracles. Uh, so uh, great joy would be also, I assume, followed by great conversions. Thank you, Luke. All right, brother Ted. Yeah, I think that the, it's it's a great thing, and I think the, uh, the thing it reminds me of uh, where it says, uh, you know, he's uh, casting out unclean spirits uh, and things like that, uh, many with diseases, palsies, lame, people being healed, and great joy resulting. I think uh, I, I, my mind immediately went to uh, Mark chapter 16, where it says, uh, you know, after... Uh, you know, Jesus had raised and everything. Uh, it says, and the disciples went forth, and it's, I haven't looked, looked at it, it's not right for me, but it says, confirming the signs which he foretold, you know, something to that effect. And this is just confirming, the, you know, the true apostleship of, uh, of or the, at least very, at the very least, discipleship, <laughs> you know, confirming that Philip was one of Christ, you know, confirming those signs that Jesus foretold would happen, the miracles and the miraculous things that were taking place there, a healing, casting out demons. I mean, these were things that Jesus foretold and promised them that they that would happen uh, after they, of course, received power <laughs> from the Holy Spirit back in Acts chapter 1. So uh, it's just a confirmation of what Jesus promised, and the people are believing it and, and getting great joy from it. Back to you, brother. Hey. We, we, we've, we've mentioned this numerous times, but I, I, this is something I think that is worth repeating over and over again, and, and that is that uh, what was the purpose of the miracles by Jesus, Peter, all the apostles, Paul, all these miracles were done, and also they're not only called miracles, but they're called signs and wonders. Uh, and it said that the Jews demanded a sign, and and we also mentioned uh, in previous studies that that um, it actually says that the reason the sign was to give um, uh, credentials. Uh, I forgot the word you used, Ted. It was it was a real good word uh, to give uh, credibility or identify that the person is is legitimate. Um, so Jesus is. And all these, all these uh, miracles, certainly, if done because they love the people, they want to heal the sick, they want to feed them, they, you know, it's, it's out of love and, and, and kindness that the miracles are done. But the, the primary reason for these miracles is they're to serve as signs and wonders to give uh, credentials that this is truly an apostle. Jesus is truly the Messiah. So that was a, there was a period of time where uh, this was the common thing, and this is what gave people confidence that that, that Jesus is is the, uh, 